ladies and gentlemen, I, um, in the first place, want to welcome Dr. Uh, Willem Berger. Uh, Willem is a wildlife vet, and he's also a very, very keen conservationist. Um, he does commercial work uh, around the transportation of wildlife, and from time to time, they also do charitable work. Recently, I'm aware that they have helped Cape Nature uh, with a certain crisis they had. And uh, uh, thank you, Willem, also for your, your heart to help others. Willem has traveled and worked in many African countries, um, including Senegal. He and his uh, partners are also involved in the Patala um, National Park in Senegal. Um, that is in their personal capacity. And thank you all for, also for the work you are doing there. He's involved in Mauritania, Oman, uh, uh, Ivory Coast, Chad, uh, Somaliland. He's traveled all over and worked all over. Um, Willem is going to do another talk after this one where he's going to go in more detail into animal or wildlife capture. There he will demonstrate in detail how to do it. However, tonight he will talk broadly and also about a uh, wildlife chapter they have done in Cote d'Ivoire, um, and Willem will take us through that. Lastly, about Willem, Willem is a, I've known Willem for many years, and Willem is a very humble person and also a very caring person. So, Willem, I've seen you in action, and I've learned a lot from you, and I thank you for giving us the time tonight. And uh, we are very eager to listen to you. So uh, we've got about 60 slides to go through. And as Chris has said, uh, we will talk superficially about the specific translocation in the Ivory Coast. Um, in between, we will, uh, we will give a little bit of information about the surrounds and what we experienced during this translocation with uh, the local Ivorians and the country. So <clears throat> there are various reasons for translocation of wildlife. And some of them are being to improve the genetic diversity of the wildlife population, to uh, introduce animals to new reserves for management purposes uh, where there are maybe too many male animals, uh, for safety purposes, specifically for rhinos, and then there are always the researchers, which are very important for the future of wildlife. And then in cases of overpopulation, of course, and the other one are the emergencies that all, always crop up. So uh, when we get to this rhino rescue in the Ivory Coast, I was fortunately uh, called by Chris in 2017, I think it was, or 2016. And he asked me if we could assist with a rhino uh, rescue operation. And subsequently, um, I contacted Louis Diakiti, who had the initiative to, to actually finance the rescue of this specific rhino, which ended up in a village. But before we get to that, this all started in, I think it was 1993, when the South African government donated um, a couple of rhino, I think it was three or four or five, which they shipped from South Africa to the Ivory Coast. And this was the, the shipment when it took place. So that is the rhino crate, and there's another one, and this is the crate with all the feed, and this was put on a ship, and then took to, for three weeks, it uh, was on the sea, uh, and arrived in Ivory Coast, and I think this is Yaku Ackerman here, who accompanied the shipment to the Ivory Coast, and settled the rhino in. And we will come back to this slide a little bit later on. But this is where it all started. And then, Louis, you can fill in, but the Civil War 
that broke out in Ivory Coast um, and lasted for about 10 years was the cause of the, I think, the demolishment of the Abuqua Macro Reserve where these rhinos were established. And then it was thought that the rhino that was, that uh, Louis was in the process of trying to save was one of the offspring of the initially introduced rhinos from South Africa. So we are based, to get to the actual Tarsa location, we are down in South Africa near George, and we had to move all the way up to Ivory Coast, which is on the western side of Africa. And this is where the, where the logistical planning starts for a big project like this. So we got together a, a film team from Homebrew in Cape Town to record what we're going to do. And this is actually the starting of, of the planning phase, which was, which took place about six months before we, the actual transfer. So we had to fly from Cape Town to Johannesburg, directly then to Ivory Coast, to Abidjan. And all of the logistics took us about six months to prepare and we'll get to the other challenges that we encounter along the planning side but to give you some background of where we had to go and Louis you can fill in here we landed in Abidjan and then we had to travel to Yamasukro which is about 240 kilometers and from there to Buake which is another I think 180 approximate kilometers and from there, we had to go north, east, somewhere around here, where apparently this rhino was near a village. And the story goes that the chief of the village was uh, trampled on by this rhino accidentally while he went for a wee at night, and the village was afraid that this rhino could hurt some of the kids, although, although it was very habituated. So uh, we sent Louis some uh, technical drawings of uh, the typical rhino holding boma because the rhino had to stay there for uh, a lengthy time to get used to its new environment to make sure it does not uh, wander off. And Louis uh, undertook then to, to get the poles and all the equipment for sliding doors and he built up a, a proper boma which I think is still there today. Uh, Louis also organized us uh, for the team all the, the visas. This is the film crew from uh, Homebrew. These three guys on the plane to Ivory Coast. And then uh, we had to, to get uh, a proper darting rifle and normally this is also a challenge to get the, the permits to fly a rifle across borders. So Louis organized um, or requested that we purchase a brand new darting rifle for the parks board. And uh, we had the licenses to import it. And then the second one was to, to get the darts there. So uh, these, Little devices are the actual darts that are used to, to they are flying syringes that contain the, the drugs that, that we use for immobilization of animals. And we will talk more about the detail of this in the next presentation. So this we took along, plus various uh, Schedule 5 and Schedule 7 drugs that we had special export and import permits from the Medicine Control Board. And all of these things take months to, uh, to get in place. Because if, uh, if we get caught with this type of thing without a license, this is controlled by the Interna International Narcotics Bureau. And for, uh, for that reason, we need proper permits to fly these very sort of dangerous drugs around. So on the way to... Uh, to 
Yamasukro, or yes, Yamasukro is the, the basilica, which the Ivorian government built, uh, and it is a it is a replica of the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. But it is just a little bit bigger. I think it's uh, Louis. It's one and a half times the size of the St. Peter's Cathedral. Uh, uh, I think that is the same size. Huh? I think that is the same size. Yeah. According exactly to Yakuya, this was this was built a little bit bigger, and uh, it's plated with gold at the top. This part and also inside, uh, most impressive place. You can see the size of this building by the size of the peoples and the stairs leading up to the cathedral, and on the inside. Uh, all these lead glass panels and Louis I think this place can seat is it 2,000 people it's enormous enormously impressive the lead glass panels the story I think you told us was that this was the architect and this was the president and the rest are the disciples and very interesting story and uh, so yeah so then we carried on uh, to a guest house that Louis organized us and there the final preparations was done for the next day to go to the area where the rhino was previously seen. And we also had to get, um, so this, these were some armed guards that accompanied us. And along the way, uh, typical African style, we stopped for some fresh food and Fruits, wonderful, colorful. And uh, we also visited the stockyard of a transport company, which had the crates that was previously used to translocate elephant. And these crates were in immaculate condition. Of course, they were not designed for rhinos. So we had to adapt them, one of them to fit the rhino in. And this is the inside of the crate. And this was our team. This is Yaku Akarwan and Louis Diakiti, the director of the transport company, the guy from Homebrew, Homebrew film crew. And um, this is Dani Victor. He's a pilot, which we took with us in case we need him and myself. So inside this uh, enormous crate, we had to make uh, a makeshift partition to keep the rhino from uh, sort of wandering around in the crate with the size of this thing was just too big. You can see this is the outside of the crate and a huge forklift to get it onto a low bed. And then various crane trucks that accompanied the convoy to where we're gonna capture this rhino, but still we had to find it. And I was lying awake all night to think, how on earth are we gonna find this rhino in the entire Ivory Coast, which is a big country. So this is on the way, beautiful forest area, uh, driving towards the village where this rhino was last seen. So from the main roads off to the dirt roads and then smaller and smaller tracks. And as we entered this village, we could not believe our eyes. This rhino that we were supposed to look for in the entire Ivory Coast was lying on the dump heap of the village as we entered the village. It was right in front of our eyes. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was totally habituated and uh, to people. And the most amazing thing is, I will come back to this slide again. Normally, when rhinos are earmarked, when they are translocated, we use this type of a pattern to clip a piece of the ear. And this is the left side. So if you have a little clip on the bottom, it means it's a one. And a one plus a three would be a four or a five plus a three is an eight. And then you go to the tens. 
So lo and behold, this rhino on its left ear, it's not that visible here, but there, exactly there is the ear mark, which is the number one. And this was the young bull that was on the ship that you saw right in the beginning of the presentation with Yakub. And the, the bull was a, approximately three or four years old when it was shipped to the Ivory Coast. And we did this translocation in 2017, which means that this bull would have been about almost 30 years old when we did the translocation. And he survived the Civil War by moving some kilometers from Abuko Mekra. And the next amazing thing was on the side of this rhino, which is not visible in these slides either, there was, there was a huge scar on the, on the left hind leg. And there was also another scar just behind the left shoulder, which we gather could have been some either bullet wounds or fighting wounds from way, way back. So this thing survived many, many challenges over many years and settled in this village where it became part of the village. But unfortunately, as we said, it caused a, uh, it became a risk for the children because they were playing soccer next to this rhino. And it was just an amazing composition of chickens and pigs and children, everybody playing around this thing. So on the arrival day, we were welcomed by the village chief and um, his subordinates, plus all the village people from the surrounding areas. And typical to the African culture, there was a big hua. Um, we could not understand everything. We had a translator and Louis was with us. So we could get some of the information, but this was a very important day and a happening. Illustrates um, what we did not expect to happen is to have a, a big welcoming party with all these people doing all their rituals. And here was the village chief right in the middle and we were we had a chance to meet the chief and initially I was thinking uh, what is all this bling on his head and this plastic chain and a plastic elephant and the, all these plastic bling on his shoes. So we went to, to transfer the greetings from South Africa to the chief. And I asked the translator, could I please uh, take a closer picture of, of the chief and the elephant? And uh, so I picked up this elephant. And to my amazement, this was made from gold thread. And not, there was not a string of plastic on this elephant or on the chain or on the headbeads or on the slip slops. So these are all handmade and typical of the Ivory Coast and the, the gold rich country. Each village chief in this country has its elephant, which is handmade, unique from gold. And obviously this was the new chief um, of the village. And here was the rhino on the soccer field just adjacent to the village. So it was just hanging around there and everything just seemed to be just too easy. Like it, it cannot be true. We didn't search for it. We didn't look for it. We drove straight towards it and there it was all day long. And we had the very proud people around um, of the protective units and the army and the parks board. And there were literally, I think about Louis, about 80 people welcoming party. Now, one of the things that struck me uh, when I look back at the pictures that we took, uh, this is the tree where we had the welcoming party and there was this guy, had, I think he had polio, 
and he had his improvised tricycle to um, to get along and what struck me was the the contrasts of footprints that we leave you know typically we have a uh, a luxury car on the one side and then we have this guy with his his low footprint model and, and there are some some lessons to be learned for us as westerners on the way that that we go about and that we we leave, all leave our footprints in different ways on earth and this this striking picture for me is something i'll never forget and of course it's hot and humid and uh, it's Esther time, so everybody takes a bit of a rest before the next day. And here we have the kids pumping water and all the friendly faces. <laughs> And they were playing soccer and the rhino was, then it was walking through the village and it was lying around and it was just a happy place. And these are the women at the washing, doing the washing. <laughs> all the beautiful children and they're all happy and, and I was thinking, what are we doing? Are we doing the right thing to remove this rhino? And then there were these pigs and they were actually the companions of this rhino. And this, this is a water hole that the pigs bath in the rhino drinks from and, and everything was just like happy, a happy place. Chickens, the village chickens, this local reed houses, low carbon footprint. So then arrives the next day and the rhino was gone. The previous day it was all around in the village and we had to go for a, set out a search team. This is Yaku in front and we were looking where this, where could we find this rhino and it's sort of in the middle of the day eventually they found this rhino and we darted it and it uh, it was just next to the village in this very dense bush so we we put a rope on it and led it out into the village, put it on a drip, uh, put some earplugs in, cut off the tip of the horn so it doesn't break it off in the crate. We had an oxygen cylinder which Louis organized for us to uh, supplement the oxygen during the uh, immobilization. Um, and it was extremely hot. There was someone pouring water on it to cool the rhino down. And this is the um, the local vet, and uh, here we are, uh, sort of half waking up the rhino from its uh, deep sleep, and then with a blindfold and straps in front and a break leg, uh, a break at the back leg, we walk this rhino into the crate that was parked just to the left inside the village. And there was a crowd, I think Louis of about 200 people and I must say the crowd control was extremely uh, difficult. There was like everybody was everywhere. But eventually we got the rhino loaded inside this big elephant crate, uh, separated it, uh, locked it up and then we completely uh, reversed the, the immobilizing drugs. So they loaded this huge crate onto that big truck and um, and off we went so then there were all these village women and they were saying goodbye to their i was thinking it was a bit of a sad moment to remove the rhino they were all waving little branches and singing and chanting And there off we went on the long road to Nzi River Lodge. And this was about all already in the late afternoon. And slowly, slowly we, uh, we moved off. And there we go. And this truck was uh, 
moving at about 60 kilometers an hour because it was huge and heavy. It was a low bed. And this guy at the bottom, Achab at the back, he had a drone that he launched that I don't have the drone footage here because it's too long, but it's some very interesting footage that he took. And this is all uh, in a uh, one hour video that was compiled by Homebrew. And I think it's still available on YouTube somewhere if you want to have a look at that. And then on the way, just uh, as we entered the a huge thund thunderstorm um, broke loose and the water just came down in buckets, like in buckets. Yeah. And we barely made it to the Boma, barely. So on the way, just as we entered the Bahamas, it was so completely wet and soaked the earth that those huge trucks got stuck and that was already turning dark in the evening when we uh, tried to offload the rhino and the, the trucks were on a slippery slope and they couldn't um, park next to the boma because they were just stuck. So fortunately, Louis uh, had a, a big uh, grader tractor, which we could then uh, pull these trucks into place for the offloading procedure. This was an actual offloading. I think, Louis, this was already almost midnight and the day was getting very long. So uh, we got the rhino into the Boma and we all went to sleep. And the next morning, uh, one of the guys sent out a drone from, the, from Louis uh, Villa to the Boma, which was about two and a half kilometers. And we all watched the screen uh, when the drone sort of hovered above the, the Boma and I almost got a heart attack because I saw the rhino was lying on its side. It looked bloated and completely dead. So we got in a truck and I, I really thought this was, you know, we had all the planning and all this uh, challenges and now we have a dead rhino. But fortunately we got there and it was just fast asleep and very tired of this long trip. And there's Louis' uh, little Jeep with, um, with Yako and Dani, also at night. So next morning, everything was fine. The rhino tested the boma. You can see there's a lot of, a bit of, um, of black tar on his skin, but he was alive and well, and we were very, very, very happy. But then, uh, and this is our film team from Homebrew, the three guys that went with, that made the documentary. And then uh, there was the, the after party. And this was the welcoming from the surrounding villages plus the authorities and the, the um, conservation authorities. And there was about another 180 people gathered under this tent right next to the Boma. And they had huge speakers lined up for the ceremony. And I said, Louis, please, you know, this poor rhino is also gonna have a heart attack now. It's not used to this type of noise. But eventually we settled in and said, okay, well, let's see what's gonna happen here. Um, and these are all the, um, the people from Parks Board and the police and the army and all the high profile people. I think the ministers were there. And so the ceremony started with a big bang and very loud. Uh, and I was getting seriously worried about this rhino. He was, he was in the boma stressing himself to pieces. But then something really um, strange, for me, strange happened. There was this guy that he was speaking in the local language. He had a, a bottle of tangerine gin on the soil in front of the tent. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is the end of the world. We're going to have a drinking spree here and this is going to end in a big disaster. But lo and behold, this is the biggest 
lesson of my life while I was in the Ivory Coast. Just look at this. So I asked the translator, what is this guy doing? And we are not used to this type of thing. And, and the translator says, this guy is taking the alcohol, which is not cheap alcohol, tangerine gin. He's sprinkling it on the ground to bless the ground where this rhino will live in future. And to tell the people from Ivory Coast how important it is to protect this rhino. And I thought this was absolutely fantastic ending for this whole exercise. I was so amazed, I still remember it up to today. This guy wasn't taught to do it. He wasn't told to do it. He just did it out of the culture and just out of the hearts. And I think this is our biggest lesson for, for Africa. And I thought about what Chris told me about this pyramid of the basic needs of Homo sapiens. A lot of the people living out in the bush are living on what we call the bread line. They don't have much, they food and housing, but still despite that, there is this absolute thing from the heart to sprinkle this very expensive uh, liquor on the ground and bless the soil where this rhino will live in future. So that's the happy ending of this whole thing. And Luya, we are still now working on the next phase to, to introduce two females for this male. And hopefully we can uh, find the finances to, to fence the reserve properly before we translocate the two females to Ivory Coast. Willem, uh, great story. Thank you very much. And it's very heartwarming to hear something like that. You say you want to find another sort of two females to, you know, to pair up with this, uh, this male. What, what's the sort of budget for something like that? I mean, how much would it cost to, to source uh, two females and, and get them sent up to, to Cote d'Ivoire? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a nice question to ask. Um, we have already got a donor who wants to donate two females from South Africa. The biggest cost is the transport to fly these animals to Ivory Coast because it has to be a, a charter flight and it takes up a large area in a plane. So we are talking about a, a dedicated charter flight would cost between three to four million rands currently. That is the biggest expense. And then of course, fencing that area properly where they will be released so they don't wander off. That is the other <laughs> expense. We can maybe elaborate on that because he's already, I think, um, approached some organizations for that and they're busy. Willem, just a question from my side. Is this the known last rhino in uh, Kotoa? Yes, Chris, this is the last rhino in uh, Kotoa. It would be from a, I think, uh, from a conservation perspective, it would be a good thing to have a breeding, uh, not a colony, but a breeding group of rhinos in a country where, where they will probably be well protected. I think because of the attitude of the people. Uh, we have enormous challenges, as you know, in South Africa, Southern Africa, to protect the rhino populations. And uh, dispersing some of these rhinos to other African countries has already been done in other countries like Chad and, and so forth, uh, I think would be beneficial for the survival of the species. Willem, I'd just like to know, uh, I see that it was a white rhino uh, that was translocated and that you worked with. Um, in terms of the habitat, the black rhino uh, and the survivability of black rhino and the reason why you actually worked with white rhino. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, initially, the white rhino was translocated there, um, as we said, I think in 93. The habitat is probably also very suitable for black rhino, maybe even more suitable for black rhino than white rhino. But there are big um, grass plains that white rhinos will also do very well. They actually did very well when they were translocated. So both species would be, the habitat would be suitable for both. I don't know anything about rhinos in general. I wanted to ask uh, if there is an estimate about how many animals should be translocated uh, to, to get a successful breeding in the time and um, about like how many years are we talking here that we would need to see uh, a population uh, growing. Uh, Yvonne, yeah, the uh, replication rate of rhinos are extremely slow. Um, we thought about taking two females as a starter, but uh, maybe we should think a little bit bigger in, in terms of time frames uh, of these replication rates being low and taking long. Maybe we should start thinking bigger about getting a bigger population settled there initially. But I think also, uh, on the other hand, it's all, always good to start small and see that everything is settled and uh, there are no hiccups before you translocate larger numbers of animals. And uh, maybe also then referring to Neil's question um, or suggestion that black rhinos would also do well in that uh, habitat. Maybe that should also be considered. There are too many black rhinos in two small areas in Southern African parks, some of the parks. So uh, it could be also something that we could pursue or investigate. Um, have you ever had to translocate any other species of animals to any other country before? Yeah, Kolia, we've, uh, we've done various species of animals uh, from zebras to ostriches to giraffes to cheetahs. Yep. Sure. Wow. Elephant. <laughs> they, I'm not an elephant expert. There are there's a there's a uh, Dr. Isis, the actual e elephant expert in Africa, that does large number of elephant translocations. <laughs> 